Left Undone Incomplete Investigation. I'm Catherine. Today, I want to talk about a story that I've been planning on sharing with you ever since I went to Hawaii. I came up with an idea that when I travel, because if you've been following my channel, you know I like to travel. I came up with an idea that wherever I go, I will research a true crime story and try to go to locations and share the information with you and what the crime story is related to that destination. So today, I wanna to talk about the Honolulu Strangler, one of the worst crimes that ever occurred on the island of Oahu. The Honolulu Strangler was an actual serial killer that to this day has never been caught. So welcome to Left Undone, Incomplete Investigations, I'm Catherine, stay tuned. However, just to let you know, it didn't quite go the way I wanted it to go. I went to Oahu last week and had researched this story and had planned to go to the destinations, the locations where the bodies had been found or the location they were abducted. But right now, since we're just getting through this pandemic, car dealers apparently have sold off all their cars. Not all of them, but they're very limited quantities of cars. Car prices to rent were actually through the roof when we were there. We did wind up getting a car for a day. Luckily, we went to Oahu, because if we would have went to any of the other islands, we would have had to have a car the whole time. But on the island of Oahu, if you stay in Waikiki Beach, you don't necessarily need a car unless you want to travel around the island. So we did wind up getting a car for one day while we were on the island, and it was $200 for the day. Rented at 8, had to be back by 4.30. I am going to share with you some of the places I went. You'll see them in the video while I tell you the story. And also the locations on the map I will share with you. All right, so let's get started on the Honolulu Strangler. The Honolulu Strangler was the first serial killer on the island of Oahu. This happened between 1985 and 1986. The Honolulu Strangler killed five women. He has never been caught. Now, just before I get into the actual victims, I want to tell you that some of this gives me a little bit of chills because between 1985 and 1986, I was 21 years old, 21, 22, and my friends and I we would fly to Hawaii all the time just to go out and go dancing, go partying, and lay on the beach. We were flight attendants at the time, so we got to fly for free. So we'd hop a flight, go to Waikiki Beach, spend a couple days there and a couple nights, go to the beach during the day, go to the bars at night, and just have a great time. I mean, we were college age kids and we were living in Arizona, right? In the area of ASU. But we had this beautiful, unbelievable benefit of being a flight attendant where you could just get on a plane for free. We did this often, and the year 1985 to 1986 was particularly one of the busiest years for me personally and my girlfriends going to that island and hanging out on Waikiki Beach. So it gives me a little bit of chills, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my personal experience during that time on the island that looking back and knowing this story really scares me. We really, truly may have gotten away from a serial killer. This guy could have gotten one of us. Maybe true, maybe not true, but I will tell you an experience we had while we were there during this time, and it really makes the hairs on my neck stand up right now. So let's get back to the actual victims who lost their life. The first one, her name was Vicki Gale Purdy. She was 25 years old and she was married to a man 
that was a helicopter pilot. He was based on the island of Oahu in the military. On May 25th, 1985, Vicki went out clubbing with her friends. She parked her car at the Shorebird Hotel in Waikiki Beach and went out dancing for the night with her friends. At the end of the night, about midnight, she got a taxi and had the taxi drop her off back at her car at the Shorebird Hotel. The Shorebird restaurant in that hotel was actually one of our favorites to go to. It was amazing. They just recently closed it when the owners decided to retire and hasn't been reopened yet. But it was somewhere we frequented very often if we wanted to go have dinner. The taxi driver actually took Vicki back to her parking garage where she had parked her car and dropped her off. Well, the taxi driver is the last reported person that actually saw Vicki alive. Vicki's car was found there at the Shorebird Hotel the next day. About a year after the murders, and basically the article goes over the victims. It sh says that the women really didn't have anything in common except for the fact they were Caucasian and young. Um, and also the general location where their bodies were found. Most were just getting into their adulthood. Um, and then when you talk about Vicki Gale Purdy, the first victim, her husband actually said that she was not a woman to be messed with, that she was tough, and earlier in their marriage when problems surfaced, she had knocked the blank out of me, he says. And he is six foot, 165 pounds. He felt like it would have taken two people to abduct her. So unfortunately, she was abducted and was found later. She was found at High Lagoon. Her hands were bound behind her back. She had been strangled and the R word. And I'm sorry I'm not going to say that word because I have come to the conclusion that there is a bot <laughs> that picks certain words out that are said in a video and makes your video um, flagged as not monetizable. So you understand what the R word is. Tragic, tragic young married woman who just went out to have some fun in the beautiful town, the beautiful city on the beautiful island of Oahu, in the beautiful town of Waikiki, and lost her life because someone nabbed her, took her, strangled her, and dumped her. When Vicki was found, she was wearing a yellow jumpsuit, and of course, like I said, her hands were tied behind her back, and she had been strangled and R. Vicki's husband told law enforcement that he thought there was a possible connection to where Vicki worked. Vicki worked in a video store that did um, rent adult-themed videos. And earlier the year before, two women were actually stabbed in that location where Vicki worked. He thought that possibly the person that murdered Vicki had frequented that location and been one of the customers there. The Strangler's second victim was a young girl by the name of Regina Sakamoto. Regina was a high school student. She was 17 years old. She went missing on January 14, 1986. She was going to grab her bus from Wapuha and take it. She had spoken to her boyfriend at 7.15 in the morning and she said she was running late. After that, Regina was never seen again, and her body was found the next day in the Kihai Lagoon, right in the same area that Vicky's body had been found. Regina was wearing a blue tank top and a white sweatshirt only. Her hands were bound behind her back, and she also had been strangled and the R word. Dark part of our Hawaii history that is rarely talked about. Five females murdered on Oahu in the 1980s, and police believe it was the work of a serial killer. A suspect was never charged, but we spoke with the brother of one of the victims, 
and he's hoping police can use new technology to solve this cold case. January 1986, Regina Sakamoto was only 17. Yeah, she was uh, late for school that day. It was in Waipahu. Um, she was sitting at the bus stop in front of diners in Waipahu. That was the last time anyone saw Regina alive. She was abducted, raped, strangled and bound. Her body found floating off Ke'ehi Lagoon. Omar was in the fifth grade at the time. I used to look up to her. I mean, she babysit me and stuff like that. And very bookish and smart and fun-loving, you know, everybody's friend kind of thing. Regina was the second of five people whose bodies were found with their hands tied behind their backs. So at that point, the law enforcement felt that this, both of these women had been killed by the same man based on their location where they were found, the way their bodies were found, with the hands bound, them being strangled, and they based their decision that, yes, this is probably the exact same perpetrator of both women. So about two weeks later, on January 30th, 1986, a young woman by the name of Denise Hughes, who was 21, became the next victim. On that day, January 30th, she was a no-show at work. She actually commuted to and from work on the city bus. She was a secretary at a telephone company, and she disappeared that day. Two days later, on February 1st, 1986, her decomposing body was actually found. Her body was found by three young fishermen in the Mauna Loa stream. Denise was wearing a blue dress and she was wrapped in a blue tarp. And if you haven't guessed it, her hands were bound behind her back. She had been strangled and R-word. So later that week, February 5th, 1986, the Honolulu Police Department decided to put together a 27 person task force to figure out what was going on and try to catch this killer. With the help of the FBI and the Green River Task Force, they put this task force together. They felt that the killer's profile was that of an opportunist, not of a stalker. So basically they felt that he took the opportunity to find people, victims that were vulnerable, weaker than him, and in a perfect opportunity to just grab them. The killings prompted HPD to form a task force that included an FBI profiler who helped put together a profile of the person they believed could be the suspect. He was described as a Caucasian male in his 30s to 40s with no criminal record. The profiler also suspected the killer targeted women near where he lived or worked. And he's an individual who may be at this particular juncture experiencing marital or girlfriend problems. And the selection of victims is probably the result of opportunity or chance encounters. Get them. Maybe he was a smooth talker, which we do find out later from people that knew him that said, yes, he was. You know, um, he, obviously sociopaths we've all seen ted bundy can be very charming and very persuasive and they seem like nice people so i'm gonna put money on that one that this guy was just mr smooth struck up a conversation on the bus followed the girl grabbed her whatever got her because now we got two people that disappeared after riding the bus or supposed to be getting the bus one that got out of a taxi and was going to be walking alone to get her car at a parking structure. And it just makes sense. So they put together this task force to go after this serial killer that they now knew they had on their hands, the three victims. They also believe he lived in the area of the attacks, either in Wa Waipuha or Sand Island. On March 26, 1986, victim number four, happened to be a woman by the name of Louise Medeiros. Louise was 25 and she lived in Waipuha. Louise had traveled to Kauai on a flight from the Honolulu airport to meet up with extended family after the death of her mother. On her way back home that day, 
She took a late night flight back home to Honolulu on March 26, 1986. She got off the plane and she let her family know that she would be taking the bus home. But once she got off the plane, she disappeared. On April 2nd, 1986, about a week later, road workers found her body um, and she was only wearing a blouse. And of course, her hands were bound behind her back. She had been strangled and forward. She was found near the Waikili stream. 36-year-old Linda Peet was the fifth and final victim of the Honolulu Strangler. According to Linda's roommate, Linda left home on the morning of April 29th, 1986, and she was going to come back home that same evening because she had a work obligation meeting that she needed to get to. She didn't come back home, and she didn't show up for work the next day. And Linda's car was found parked on Nimitz H1 Viaduct with no Linda anywhere to be found. So at that point, the roommate reported Linda missing to law enforcement. A few days later, after Linda disappeared, on May 3rd, 1986, a man by the name of Howard Gay, he was 43 years old, he inserted himself into this investigation. So I found some more interesting information on Howard Gay after I recorded this. So I wanted to edit this and put this in there. He actually went to the police and said he found some bones on Sand Island. And they tested the bones. The bones turned out to be pig bones. So they put him under surveillance and they started watching him. And on May 9th, they arrested him because there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that could link him to the killings. He matched the behavioral profile and he was connected to all the crime scenes since he worked at the airport. And most of those victims' spots they were dumped was very close to the airport. He also lived in close proximity to Waipuha. And that's where two victims disappeared and where Luis Medeiros' body was found. And then, something even more interesting, he drove a cream-colored van with letters on its rear, rear windows. Now, what's interesting about Howard's van the same afternoon that her car was found abandoned and unlocked, it was found near the Kihai Lagoon in an intersection. So people came forward and said that on the evening of April 29th, they did see her car's emergency lights flashing. So the car most likely stalled. They also described a Caucasian man, probably in his late 30s or early 40s, medium build, with a cream-colored van with letters on its rear window. They saw it beside Peace's vehicle, Linda's vehicle. Then on May 3rd, her body actually was found on Sand Island in the general vicinity of the Kihai Lagoon. The cords that the women were tied with behind their back was parachute cord. And he would have access possibly to parachute cord because he worked at the airport. Now, Linda Pace's boss claimed she had written down Gay's phone number on a notepad the day that she disappeared. Since at that time, Linda was looking for customers in the airport area. Also, like Regina Sakamoto, he fastened the body to the shore to make sure that it was discovered. He did bring the police on the dump site of Peace's murder, and he offered to take a polygraph test. Now, some sources say he failed. Others say it was inconclusive. And he consented to a search of his home. But they wound up releasing him. They said, thought they didn't have quite enough evidence to win a case. After he was arrested and released, there were no more killings. And then later, he actually returned to California very soon later, June of 1986, a month later, um, to see his son graduate from high school. And then 
After that, three days later, his son was killed in an automobile accident. And that prompted Howard Gay to become a born-again Christian. He eventually died of kidney failure in November of 2003. He was never convicted or brought to trial, but the detectives, the people on the task force, they were absolutely convinced that he actually was the Honolulu Strangler. And according to his ex-wife and ex-girlfriend, he was a smooth talker. And they both provided law enforcement with a potential clue. They said that they had engaged with him in bondage activities where they he enjoyed binding their arms behind their back, etc. So this is actually something that he does engage in when he's having sex with a woman and the same way that these women's bodies were found. So this was a big clue for law enforcement that he was a prime suspect. His girlfriend actually said that on the nights where they were really fighting, he would leave the house. And those nights actually correlated with the nights that these women disappeared. So I don't know, there's a heck of a lot of clues here about this guy. And I think in this day and age, the DNA evidence, the cameras, he wouldn't have been able to get away with this. There'd be cameras on the street, you know, and back in the 80s, there wasn't. We didn't have cameras all over the airports, cameras on the buses, cameras in the streets. We have cameras now and we have DNA now thankfully, but clearly it was too late for these women to ever get justice because it was 1985, 1986. Eventually a suspect was arrested, but he was never charged. And unfortunately he has since passed away. Gary Diaz was head of HPD's homicide detail at the time. Based on the evidence that we had and uh, the witnesses that we had, because we did have witnesses and we did have physical evidence, uh, we felt we had enough. What would you like to see happen at this point? Uh, if it were, I really would prefer like DNA testing, you know, stuff like that, just to make sure, you know, if the guy's innocent, the guy's innocent, you know. DNA could have been a much greater asset for us in that particular case. At the time, all they could do was test for blood type. And, um, it's useless in today's age because 82% of the people of the world are types O and types A. And unfortunately back then, there was no cell phone video and surveillance video wasn't common. Digital evidence is extremely important toward the advancement of, of investigations. It's, it's kind of sad that both my parents won't be, you know, they're not here to I mean, if it does get resolved, they're not here to see it. Just, you know, I just want, uh, what is that, closure? We started asking HPD about the serial killer case and the Diane Suzuki and Lisa Al cases last month. Today, we finally learned HPD's homicide detectives are stepping up efforts to review cold cases. That includes looking for untested evidence and any evidence that should be retested using updated technology. And the department has created a database with all the information on what's been tested and what needs to be retested. That should help current and future investigators. So what about retesting evidence in the serial killer Diane Suzuki and Lisa Al cases? Well, HPD says it can't comment on that because those cases are still open. But added, quote, we will pursue all leads, whether it's from someone who has new information or a new form of DNA testing. We are committed to getting justice for victims and their families, no matter how long it takes, end quote. Now, before I go on, I'm going to tell you what happened to us. We, like I said, we used to fly into Waikiki Beach. So you can see he's a, uh, victims on buses and airports, and that's what we did. We didn't rent cars. We took public transportation from the airport to our, wherever we were going to stay. Sometimes we stayed with friends there because we made friends. Other times we stayed in a hotel. But... We would go to the beach every day from in the morning when we woke up, say 10 o'clock, to about 2 or 3. Then we would scurry on over to a place called Moose McGillicuddy's. 
it had a lot of cute boys back in the day. A lot of the military young guys were there and they were cute and fun. I have pictures. Anyway, one of the nights we were there rather late and there were three of us. We decided it was time to go. You know, late night, time to go, we're done. We've been in the sun all day, we're tired. Let's go back to our hotel. So we started to leave and my roommate, who was my roommate back at home, and I went through flight attendant training with her, one of my very, very good friends, she still is, um, was talking to a guy. I cannot tell you what this guy looked like. I don't know how old he was. I don't remember anything of that. But I do remember that she was talking to this guy. And as we left, the other two of us girls walked kind of ahead. Um, as we were walking up the street, she was walking behind us talking to this guy. Well, I turned around, she's gone. And I was like, where the heck is Michelle? Where'd she go? And I'm like, I don't know. So we walk back and down one of like the alleyway type streets, there she was. They were walking off. Didn't say a word to us. I was like, what is going on? Remember, we were partying and drinking and all that kind of stuff. I don't know why, but she just went with them. And, and I was like, Michelle, Michelle. And she was like, huh. I'm like, come here. And, the, and I remember this so well. The guy was like guiding her and kind of making her go with. And I was like, Michelle, come here. And he kept walking her away. And so I started to go towards him. And so did my other friend. We were coming towards him. We're like, get over here. Get over here. And he just kind of looked and he was like, you know, and he let her go. And she came to us. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? And now that I know that this was the exact year where these women were murdered, it just scares me. I just think that really could have been one of us. It could have been any of us, you know. Um, and this guy took the opportunity when he saw it. The first girl, uh, Vicki Gale Purdy. I just saw her at the bar and followed her when she got in the taxi and got her, you know. Who knows? But scary. Teach your kids, teach your girls especially to be very aware of their surroundings. Try not to go anyplace alone. Don't talk to strangers, even now. Private businesses decided to offer a $25,000 reward for anyone that gave them the information that led to the capture of the Honolulu Strangler. And then two months after Howard Gay had been arrested, a woman came forward. This woman actually described Linda Peace and Howard Gay, and she said that she had seen Howard Gay with Linda Peace the night she disappeared. She was actually able to pick him up out of a lineup. And they were like, okay. But this woman refused to testify as a witness. Can you do that? Can you do that? I mean, that's just so scary. She was afraid for her own life because she was concerned that Howard Gay had actually seen her and would recognize her as the witness. Howard Gay died in the early 2000s. No one has ever been convicted, caught, prosecuted for these crimes. I'm wondering if they have DNA or something they could still link them to in this day and age. You hear this stuff often and to me, it sounds like whoever the perpetrator was, was living on the island for a brief period of time, maybe left after that, found new victims somewhere else in the, in the United States. Who knows? You know, during that time, Honolulu, Waikiki Beach was booming with tourism. Every division of the U.S. military had a base there on Oahu. There was a lot of people coming and going, flights coming and going, huge tourist area. So the perpetrator could have been anyone, but Howard Gay sure does look pretty suspicious in my opinion. I really, really, really wish I could have been able to go to all these spots and I will do better on my next vacation with my next story. And hopefully rental cars will be available. So if you're new here and you 
like my channel, please subscribe. Ring the bell, you'll get notifications when I go live or when I post new videos. We do try to go live on Saturday mornings during the peak of the pandemic. I was here every Saturday morning doing a live stream. Life is a little bit more relaxed now. We can get out of our houses more. We're vaccinated, I'm vaccinated, and I feel a lot more comfortable about starting to travel and go back and forth to where my kids are, that kind of thing. Since I'm not gonna be live consistently every Saturday morning at 10.30 Pacific time, it'd be best if you ring that bell so that you know. We'll get a notification. Oh, there she is. Catherine's on. Anyways, thank you guys all so much. I appreciate you all. My people that have been here from the beginning, I love you guys. You guys are amazing and awesome. And I am so grateful to have such an intelligent group of people that follow my channel. The low drama, the good, kind-hearted subscribers. That's what I want. I want quality over quantity. My videos, I try to make them quality over quantity. You're not gonna get a video every week. You're not gonna get a video every day from me, but I promise you I will do my best and make the video 